Good evening, Holy Family. Welcome back to our parish mission, Be, Live, Go, Forward Together as Disciples of Jesus, where tonight we're going to focus on prayer. Esta noche nos hace hincapié en la oración. So again, before we start, just a couple reminders. If you do have a cell phone, if you could please put it on vibrate or do not disturb for the mission tonight. Si tienes tu celular, por favor, activa la opción de no molestar. And just like last night, we're going to follow the same format. We'll begin together in the church with a song and prayer and scripture. Following that, those who speak Spanish will go with Sister Carol Ann to Father Williams Hall, while the English will remain here with Sister Janet. Then we'll gather together at the end around 8 o'clock or so, and that time we'll do a common ritual, and then we invite everybody back to Father Williams Hall for a social after. Cada sesión de la misión es igual. Empieza aquí en la iglesia con oración y escritura. Después, los que hablan español van a Father Williams Hall con la hermana Carol Ann para la presentación. Después, nos reunimos aquí en la iglesia para la ritual de la oración conclusiva. Y después, todos están invitados a Father Williams Hall para una marienda. Let's take a moment now and call to mind that we're in God's presence as we stand and join in our opening song. Before we pray our opening prayer tonight, let's just take a moment of quiet prayer to pray for those grieving and suffering in Nashville. And we continue to pray. Holy, loving God, we live in your presence. 
Though sometimes we are unaware of your all-surrounding being, which enfolds us every minute. O oh, Senor, ayúdanos a darnos cuenta de que nunca estamos solos, que no podemos evitar vivir abrazado por ti, nuestro Dios amoroso. Gracias por preocupar por lo que nos importa. Conoces nuestras necesidades. Eres todo poderoso y todo amoroso. Our lives are our prayer. And sometimes we are even aware of the prayer we live all day, every day, confident in your love and power. We rejoice in those moments those moments every day of profound encounter with you. Amen. 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 A reading from the letter of St. Paul to the Romans. In hope we were saved. Now hope that sees for itself is not hope. For who hopes for what one sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait with endurance. In the same way, the Spirit, too, comes to the aid of our weakness, for we do not know how to pray as we ought. But the Spirit itself intercedes with inexpressible groanings. And the one who searches hearts knows what is the intention of the Spirit, because it intercedes for the Holy Ones according to God's will. Porque ya es nuestra la salvación, pero su plenitud es todavía objeto de esperanza. Esperar lo que ya se posee no es tener esperanza. ¿Por qué? ¿Cómo se puede esperar lo que ya se posee? En cambio, si esperamos algo que todavía no poseemos, tenemos que esperarlo con paciencia. El Espíritu nos ayuda en nuestra debilidad, porque nosotros no sabemos pedir lo que nos conviene, pero el Espíritu mismo intercede por nosotros, con gemidos que no pueden expresarse con palabras. Y Dios, que conoce profundamente los corazones, sabe lo que el Espíritu quiere decir, porque el Espíritu ruega conforme a la voluntad de Dios por los que le pertenecen. Palabra de Dios. Los que van a participar en español, vamos a hablar por allá, por, a, 
Father William Saul. Father William Saul. We stand in time with my heart can you. As I mentioned last night, I need to watch my time because we're going to join back together with both groups around 8 o'clock. So one day, or one time, there were two boys, little boys, who were very good friends. One was Catholic and one was Protestant. And so often they would go to one another's churches with each other. And one morning, one Sunday morning, they were in the Catholic church and they were right in the front pew. And as liturgy began, the little Protestant boy would lean over to the Catholic boy and say, what does that mean? What's happening? Why are they doing that? And the little Catholic boy would, would tell him. So came to the liturgy of the word and the lector proclaimed the first and second reading and the deacon proclaimed the gospel and everyone sat down and father came to the ambo for the homily. And when he came to the ambo, he went, and the little Protestant boy said to the Catholic boy, what does that mean? And the Catholic boy said, not a thing. <laughs> The foundation of our discipleship, which we talked about last night, is of course prayer. And what's interesting and challenging and exciting is that often prayer isn't just about us and God, but it's also about our relationship with other people. If I asked you what your definition of prayer is, if you didn't use the definition that many of us memorized, when we were younger, everybody would probably have a little bit different definition. It's really hard to define prayer. In fact, the catechism, the Catholic catech the United States Catholic Catechism of, of the church says it's impossible to define prayer. We can only describe it. Because when we define it, it's like we take one idea about prayer and then say, this is prayer. So it's like saying, trying to define sports and saying sports is baseball. Well, it's true that baseball is sports, but sports is a lot of other things. And so if we say prayer is talking to God, and it is, but we're also we're limiting it because it's more than that. So what I'd like to do for uh, the beginning tonight is to look at a couple of ideas of what prayer is not. Now, for some of them, it's not that this isn't part of prayer, but it isn't the whole thing, okay? So first of all, hmm. prayer is not just saying prayers. Now, that's not saying that saying prayers are not important, but it's more than that. There's a study on the slave traders in America that tells how the Englishman John Newton 
packed suffocating human beings chained to one another in the hold of his ship. And then he went to his comfortable cabin to read the Bible and say his prayers. Jesus says, when you pray, do not imitate the hypocrites. They love to stand up in the synagogues and on street corners for people to see them. In your prayers, do not babble as the pagans do, for they think that by using many words, they will make themselves heard. For Jesus, the real concern of prayer is not just saying the words, but is the attitude and the life in which our prayers are prayed. Is it in the context of justice and love of neighbor? Or is it like the slave trader? Jesus demanded social obligations before prayer. At another place in the Gospels, Jesus says, if you come to the altar and remember that your sister or brother has something against you, leave your gift, stop your prayer, and go and be reconciled first. According to Jesus, the real test is not just saying words, but is the attitude and the way we live. Prayer is also not causing God to change by our petitions. There was a, a fella who owned two male parrots, and his male parrots loved to say the rosary. And he had a friend who had a female parrot, and this female parrot had very colorful language. And so the friend asked the owner of the two male parrots if he would take his female parrot for a couple of weeks, because he thought that their good example would rub off on the female parrot. As they arranged that to happen, and the friend brought the female parrot over, and they opened the door to the birdcage to put the female parrot in, the one male parrot turned to the other male parrot and said, see, I told you God answers prayers. <laughs> Sparky Anderson used to say, if God lets you hit a home run the last time you were up, then who struck you out the time before that? Jewish prayer in the Old and New Testament which is the prayer that Jesus prayed, is not primarily asking God for something. Prayer for the Jewish people was primarily thanking God and recalling the presence of God among them, both in their own lives and in their history as a people. The Father of whom Jesus speaks is a loving Father and friend. And a friend isn't someone that we just ask to do things for us as, one, as much as it is a person who's with us. And by their presence, we are supported and encouraged in doing what we're called to do. A friend is someone who allows us to change simply by being with us and God is always with us. So prayer in the Gospels is not magic. It's not bartering. It's not a bribe. It's not a tit for a tat. One day, Timmy had decided that he wanted a bicycle for Christmas, wanted it more than anything else in the world. So he decided to write God a letter and he said, Dear God, if you bring me a bicycle for Christmas, I promise I will be a good boy for one whole year. Love, Timmy. Then he looked at the letter and thought, that's kind of hard. So he ripped up the letter and wrote God a second letter. 
saying, Dear God, if you bring me a bicycle for Christmas, I promise I will be a good boy for six months. Love, Timmy. But then he decided he didn't like that letter either. Still thought that was a little too much. So he decided to stop writing letters and took, looked for other ways to get his bicycle. The following Sunday, as always, Timmy's parents and he went to church. And as Timmy walked into church that morning, he saw this beautiful statue of Mary on the side altar. Now he'd seen the statue many times before, but it was on this Sunday that the statue touched him in a special way. And so when Mass was finished, Timmy asked his parents if he could stay behind and walk home alone. And because they only lived down the block from the church, his parents said yes. So when everybody else had left church, Timmy got up and walked to the front where the statue was. Standing before Mary, he smiled, and then he turned around to make sure there was nobody else left in church. And then he reached up and took the statue down. He carried the statue home under his coat, went immediately to his bedroom and put the statue under his bed. And then he wrote another letter. And the letter said, Dear God, I've got your mother. Bring me my bicycle. It wouldn't be much of a Christmas without your mother. Love, Timmy. But unlike Timmy, for us, prayer is not bribing or bartering. Prayer is a loving presence responded to maturely. When, when petition is present, and it is present, especially in the Our Father, the prayer that Jesus taught us, it's found within the context of praise. The first three petitions of the Our Father are prayers of praise and thanksgiving. And the emphasis is on confidence in God's love rather than dwelling just on my request. So in many ways, prayer is not meant to change the world. Prayer is meant to change us so that we can then change the world. Kathleen Norris, a writer of much about spirituality says, Prayer is not asking for what you think you want, but asking to be changed in ways you can't imagine. So also, prayer is not just giving things to God, not letting God do all the work. St. Ignatius said, pray as though everything depended upon God. Work as if everything depended on you. There was a, a farm that had been in a family for generations. And finally, the last survivors of that family had died, and so there was no one to inherit the farm within the family. And so the farm was put up for sale, and it was on the market for quite a while before someone bought it. And one day, um, it was bought, and the new owner worked very hard to get it back into shape because it had been overrun with weeds and the ground was not conducive to planting anything. So he worked very hard for weeks to get it back in shape. One day, he was in town at the general store and he met one of his neighbors. And one of his, neighbor, his neighbors said to him, wow, you and God did a really good job with that field. And the new owner said, 
You should have seen it when God had it all by himself. <laughs> Prayer presupposes a commitment to assume responsibility for what we're praying for, a commitment to be part of the solution. I heard someone say once, the best way to pray for another person is first to become what you're praying for that person to be. In many ways, we can't pray for someone else. We can only pray with them. We can't avoid the company of others who are suffering and are in need. Think about if someone asks you to pray for them because they're sick, and you promise to pray for them, and you do, but you never call, you never visit, you never send a card, you never offer to help their family, Is our prayer complete? The writer C.S. Lewis said, I am often, I believe, praying for others when I should be doing things for them. It's so much easier to pray for a bore than to go and see him. So prayer of petition is not giving God good advice on how to run the world. For instance, praying, God, help those in the third world find enough to eat. Or God, please put an end to violence. A friend of mine, her family at dinner time, Pray, pray, pray prayers that are very similar to the general intercessions we pray at Mass. And so they pray for different intentions, different petitions. And one night while they were praying, their third grader interrupted them. And he said, we're praying all wrong. And she said, okay, Brian, um, what do you mean? we're praying all wrong. And he said, well, we're praying for the poor people to have enough to eat, for God to give the poor people enough food. And we're praying for Mrs. Jones down the street, whose husband just died because she's lonely. And so we're praying to God to take care of her and to take away her loneliness. He said, maybe we should be praying and asking God to give us the love and the courage to help the poor people. Maybe we should be praying and asking God to nudge us, to help us to remember, to invite Mrs. Jones to dinner once a week. Every statement about the prayer of petition in the New Testament is, is associated with a statement about love, about charity, charity toward our brothers and sisters. We are the hands and ears of God. And if we don't listen and we don't act, is that limiting what God can do? According to the New Testament, prayers are answered only in genuine community. The Christ who answers prayers is we who act like the body of Christ. There's a proverb that says, prayer without action is like drawing water with a woven basket. There's another proverb that says, God gives the birds their food, but he doesn't put it in their nest. We are God's hands. 
St. Thomas More said once, that prayed once, or probably prayed many times, the things, good Lord, that I pray for, give me your grace to labor for. Prayer is also not just going apart with God. And again, that's not to say that there's not times we need to do that. That even in every day, we need to find quiet time to be with God. And to make time throughout our days, throughout our weeks, to be with God. But that's not the only thing about prayer. There's a story, a legend, about Saint Scholastica. She was visiting her brother, Saint Benedict, for their once a year meeting. They both lived in their own monasteries, which were several miles apart. And once a year, they came to another monastery that was midway between their two to have a visit. And this particular time, they talked all through the day, were having a wonderful conversation. And as evening came, Scholastica begged Benedict to stay the night so that they could continue their conversation a little bit longer. Benedict was horrified. He reminded her that that would break the holy rule that it was totally out of the question. And so Scholastica buried her face in her hands and was quiet. And in a while, not very long, there was a crack of thunder and lightning and rain came down in such torrents that it was impossible for them to leave and to travel the roads. Benedict said, Scholastica, what have you done? To which she replied, well, Benedict, I asked you to grant me a favor and you refused, so I asked God. I think that's a story about the prayer of presence. There's the presence we have with each other in all kinds of places, certainly in our homes, with our families, in our neighborhoods. There's the presence in the checkout line where people are hurried. There's the presence in a crowded elevator when you take a moment to smile and say hello to another person that you don't know. There's the presence of a smile for someone in the store. There's the presence of the sharing of grief, the sharing of suffering. There's the gift of presence when we say, please, or may I help you, or we step aside to let someone else pass, or we let a car go in go first out of the parking lot. Are all of those things prayer? I think they are for people who understand that Christian life, the life of discipleship, is rooted in Jesus' words. Whatsoever you do to the least of my sisters and brothers, you do for me. Jesus spent more time being present to others than withdrawing from them and going into the desert or out into a boat out on the sea to pray. And it was Jesus who said, pray always. Prayer is not separate from life. I read this um, in an article years ago, and I need to remember it. The author said, we pray in, not apart from, our world. 
the baby you bathe, the child you teach, the client you counsel, the spouse you shop for, the neighbor you look out for, the friend you phone when they're lonely. These are Christ. You pray not apart from, but immersed in them. The peace and quiet of the moon on the lake beckon, but our home and way to the Lord are behind the windows of those apartments, those homes, with all of the noise, struggle, and turmoil that lies there. And this is my favorite line. If the Lord wanted us to come to him in the peace of the lake, he would have made us fish and not people. So I love to be by the water and to pray. And that's a good place to pray. But what this author is reminding us is that we pray mostly immersed in our life around us, the people around us. Our prayer is not separate from life. Prayer is not just always asking. It's not dwelling on our lack, our needs, always asking for things. Now again, that's not to say that, that asking in prayer is not part of prayer, but it's not the only thing. Often our prayers of petition are asking from God, bargaining with God. And yet most people tell us that the primary way we pray should be praise and thanksgiving. Meister Eckhart said, if the only prayer you ever pray is thank you, that would be enough. One of the major goals of religion is to teach people to focus gratefully on what they have instead of being aware predominantly of what they don't have. Unfortunately, I think our society today helps us to dwell on our lack, the things that we don't have. And sometimes I think we've confused God with Santa Claus and believe that prayer means making an inventory of everything that I'd like to have but don't have, and persuading God that we deserve it. But when we dwell on what we don't have, when we dwell on our lack of things, or things we think that we're lacking, often we're missing the things that we do have. Prayer of thanks each day might make us more aware of all that we have and who our God is. I'm sure that many of you do it, and it's a spiritual practice that's often recommended that people keep a, a gratitude journal, and at the end of the day, write down three or four things for which they're grateful. And many years ago, when I started that, when I began it, I had a very difficult time. I could have written down three or four things, or more than three or four things, of, of things that happened that day that, that I wasn't happy about, that didn't, in my mind, go right, or things that I needed, things that I wanted. But because I promised myself I would do this, I stuck with it. And the longer I did it, the more I realized how much I was taking for granted because I was, I was looking at the things that were upsetting to me, I wasn't looking at all the gifts that there were, all the things that there were to be thankful for. One year, I asked one of my nieces if she had written her letter to Santa yet, and she said, no, I haven't. And so I offered to help her, and she said, no thanks, I'm not going to write to him this year. 
And so I was a little bit concerned that maybe her older brother had said something about Santa. And so I said, Michelle, don't you believe in Santa? And she said, oh yes, I believe in Santa. He's always been very good to me. And I said, well then, why don't you want to write a letter to him this year? And she immediately said, I don't want to write to Santa because if I write and tell him all the things I want, I'll never know what he just wanted to give me. And I thought, when she said that, what a great commentary that is on the only form of prayer that many of us consistently use, telling God what we need and asking God to give it to us. And again, as I said at the beginning, it's not saying that we shouldn't do that, but if that's the only way that we pray, of making a list of all the things we need and telling God that we deserve them, then perhaps we're missing something. Prayer is not also just me doing all the talking. Again, it doesn't mean that, that a one reality about prayer is conversing with God. But prayer is not just about me. Prayer is about God. So why do we think we have to do all the talking? Think about the gospel passage of the disciples on the road to Emmaus. As they listened to Jesus explaining the scriptures to them. They talked at the beginning, but they finally calmed down and listened. One of my favorite scripture passages is from the Psalms, where the psalmist prays, be still and know that I am God. In stillness is one of the prime ways we come to know God. When I was ministering in a parish, um, one day after um, the faith formation sessions, one of the kindergartners said to me, why is prayer so noisy? And I think he got it. I think he knew that sometimes we just fill it all up with, with our noise. And do we take time also to listen? One of the ways to describe prayer is prayer is listening inside ourselves to know we're not alone. St. Francis de Sales said, in prayer, more is accomplished by listening than by talking. Let us leave to God the decisions as, as to what shall be said. And in a book on prayer that was written a little while ago, in 1931, the author says, in our prayer with God, there are things which can be and should be formulated in words. But there are also things for which we can find no words. That is the way it can be when we are praying. It can be just resting as a child would do on a mother's lap. We can say to God, I have nothing to tell you. May I just lie here a while and rest. And one more idea is prayer is not just for comfort, but it's also challenging. Years ago, there was a, a survey in the Detroit Free Press asking people why they prayed. And it was like 89% of the people, their first answer was they prayed for comfort. And that's true, that's true, but again, it doesn't end there. There's a, a line in a book that says, if you don't want to change, then don't pray. Prayer is challenging. It calls us to change. We would be more comfortable if prayer didn't disturb us, but rather told God to change so we didn't have to. Margaret Gibb wrote, we must move from asking God to take care of the things that are breaking our hearts 
to praying about things that are breaking God's heart. And again, I don't think she meant that we shouldn't ask God, talk to God about the things that are breaking our hearts, but we can't stop there. Because the person of prayer is not a person of private agendas. And the more we become like God, the bigger our hearts will be. The challenge we have, and what prayer calls us to, if, if we pray and listen, is we have no sense anymore of we and they, or them and us, or me or mine, but that we're all one. So those are a few ideas of what prayer is not. So if that's not what prayer is, then what really is prayer? So in a moment, I'm gonna put on the screen one word, and when it appears, would all of you please read it together? Okay, ready? Okay. So none of us would say God is nowhere, and none of us would deny that God is now here. Now that is just probably an optical illusion. It's where our eyes go when we see that word all together and how we separate it. But in real life, the challenge we have is always remembering that God is always here, sometimes more than we can ever imagine. I love the story of the teacher who said to her students, I'll give you an orange if you could tell me where God is. And one astute young person said, I'll give you two oranges if you can tell me where God is not. So one description of prayer, this isn't a definition, it's a description of prayer that makes sense to me right now. Six months from now, it might be another description. Prayer is recognizing what we already have. Whether we know it or not, we already are in the presence of God. We're already united with God. We're one with God. And so prayer helps to bring that awareness to my mind, my spirit that precious bond that we have with God. Thomas Merton said, in prayer we discover what we already have. We already have everything, but we don't know it, and we don't experience what we already possess. The whole thing boils down to giving ourselves in prayer a chance to realize that we have what we seek. We don't have to rush after it. It is there all the time. If there's any problem, the problem is with us. We're not aware enough. I believe that all people experience God, but some people don't realize that they experience God. It's like, again, the disciples on the road to Emmaus. When Jesus joined them, they were so intent on their own sadness and their own disappointment that they did not recognize Jesus. So prayer is about awareness, making us more aware of who we are and where we come from. This is similar to the story I used last night, but there were two little fish who met a frog beneath a rock, and the frog said to them, don't you know you're in great danger, little fish? And the fish said no. They were very scared. And the, cruel frog said, don't you know fish, <clears throat> fish can't live without water? You better find some water very quickly or you're gonna die. And so the fish swam home to their mother in great distress and said, mother, mother, the frog says, if we don't find some water quickly, we're gonna die. What's water, mother? And she said, because she was an agnostic, she said, I don't know. I never heard anything about water. Let's go and ask the otter. So they went to the otter, and the otter said, Water, my dears, 
why you live in water. That's what you breathe. We live in God. That's what we breathe. So prayer is one way we have to walk deeply in God's presence. Ultimately, I pray so that I don't lose awareness of God with me. Prayer helps us to recognize what we already have. It's not a way of being pious. It's a creative way of being human. Prayer is not to get something. It's to remind ourselves of who we are, whose we are. In reality, we could say that prayer is a waste of time because it's not for something. Prayer is not about finding God or coming into God's presence because we're already there. It's about recognizing the God who is so close to us. God's presence is so common, so real in our daily lives that sometimes we might take it for granted. If I held this piece of paper close to my eyes, I couldn't read it because it's too close. Sometimes we can't see things that are so close to us. Prayer is about being in the presence of God. Teresa of Avila said, prayer is look, looking at God, looking at me. There's a book um, that was written several years ago by a medical doctor about prayer. The title of the book is Healing Words. And at, near the end of the book, he tells a story that he was visiting someone who was terminally ill in the hospital. And he asked this gentleman, he said, what do you pray for? And the dying man said, I don't pray for anything. How would I know what to ask for? And that surprised him because he thought, surely this man who was dying could think of some request. And so I said to him, if prayer is not for asking, then what's it for? And the, the dying man said, it isn't for anything. It mainly reminds me I am not and never alone. So I'd like to share another um, short story with you as we end. My grandparents were married for over half a century and played their own special game from the time they had met each other. The goal of their game was to write the word Shmiley in a surprise place for the other to find. They took turns leaving Shmiley around the house, and as soon as one of them discovered it, it was their turn to hide it once more. They dragged Shmiley with their fingers through the sugar and flour containers to await whoever was preparing the next meal. They smeared it in the dew on the windows overlooking the patio, where my grandma always fed us warm homemade pudding with blue food coloring. Shmiley was written in the steam left on the mirror after a hot shower, where it would reappear bath after bath. At one point, my grandmother even unrolled an entire roll of toilet paper to leave Shmiley on the very last sheet. There was no end to the places Shmiley would pop up. Little notes with Shmiley scribbled hurriedly were found on dashboards and car seats or taped to steering wheels. The notes were stuffed inside shoes and left under pillows. Shmiley was written in the dust upon the mantel and traced in the ashes of the fireplace. This mysterious word was as much a part of my, my grandparents' house as the furniture. It was obvious that they loved each other. Grandma and Grandpa held hands every chance they could. They stole kisses as they bumped into each other in their tiny kitchen. They finished each other's sentences and shared the daily crossword puzzle and word jumble. My grandma whispered to me about how cute my grandpa was, 
how handsome and old he had grown to be. She claimed that she really knew how to pick him. Before every meal, they bowed their heads and gave thanks, marveling at their blessings. A wonderful family, good fortune in each other. But there was a dark cloud in my grandparents' life. My grandmother had breast cancer. The disease had first appeared 10 years earlier. As always, Grandpa was with her every step of the way. He comforted her in their yellow room, painted that way so that she could always be surrounded by sunshine, even when she was too sick to go outside. Now the cancer was again attacking her body. With the help of a cane and my grandfather's steady hand, they went to church every morning. But my grandmother grew steadily weaker until finally she could not leave the house anymore. For a while, Grandpa would go to church alone, praying to God to watch over his wife. Then one day, what we all dreaded finally happened. Grandma was gone. Smiley. It was scrawled in yellow on the pink ribbons of my grandmother's funeral bouquet. As the crowd thinned and the last mourners turned to leave, my aunts, uncles, cousins, and other family members came forward and gathered around Grandma one last time. Grandpa stepped up to my grandmother's casket, and taking a shaky breath, he began to sing to her. Through his tears of grief, the song came, a deep and throaty lullaby. Shaking with my own sorrow, I will never forget that moment. For I knew that although I couldn't fathom the depth of their love, I had been privileged to witness its unmatched beauty. Smiley, see how much I love you. I think that God sends us smileys every day. The sunsets, the seasons, our friends, our family, phone calls when we just need them at this time. They're all God's signatures that God is interacting with our life all the time. God is always with us, even in the rough times. Prayer, I think, is the means that we have to always put us in touch with that reality, to remind us of that reality, that God is always with us. I pray to remind myself that I'm not alone. I am one with God. God is always with us, no matter what the circumstances. And prayer helps me to constantly be aware of that, to become even more deeply aware of how much God's presence is one with us. And so, our other group should be back in a minute, um, but maybe we could take a couple of minutes of quiet while we're waiting for them to come back and think about, did you hear something that you never thought about before? Did you hear something that you wonder about? Did you hear something that you want to do something about? Or is there something that you need to think more about? about your prayer, your closeness with God. And if we have a minute, if you want to turn to someone 
in front of you, next to you, um, and share a thought that you're having right now, um, I invite you to do that like, like you did last night. What does prayer mean for you? Can we invite you back together? Another reality about prayer that I'm sure you're aware of is that we never pray alone. We pray in community. Even hermits who live alone pray in union with the whole church, with people all over the world. And so we never, we never pray even if we're praying by ourselves. We're always praying, connected to others. And so tonight, in a few moments, we're going to invite you to find another person, probably someone sort of near you, but hopefully someone that you don't know really well. And then when the two of you get together, we would invite you to tell the other person of a specific intention, a specific person, a specific petition for which you would like them to pray for during the coming week. And after you tell each other that, you might also pray a very short prayer right then. For example, may God bless your mother with peace and strength and healing. So you're going to find a person that you don't know very well and then tell that person, and each person will do this, tell that person something you would like them to remember in their prayers that's one of your intentions. And then if you'd like to, say a short prayer right then. And then when you've finished, instead of going back to your own seat, just stay where you are for our remaining um, prayer and closing song. And then, then you can go back to your seat when we're all done, okay? <clears throat> Oramos en comunidad. Y 
estás invitado ahora, en un momento, a acercarse a otra persona, posiblemente sentado bastante cerca de ti, alguien que tú no conoces bien, Luego, a decirle al nombre de alguien por quien ora durante la próxima semana y en este momento, o una intención que tiene. Cada uno puede rezar una breve oración en este momento por la intención o la persona de la otra de su compañero o compañera. Y por ejemplo, que, que Dios bendiga a tu madre con paz, fortaleza y sanación. Y cuando haya terminado, quédese con este compañero para la oración y canto final. Por eso le invito ahora de encontrar compañero o una compañera con quien va a orar y comenzar su oración. And we invite you now to find another person with whom you're going to pray uh, this, this prayer.
Let's take about a few moments and just take all these prayers and draw them to a close. Tomamos un momento para para acabar con las oraciones que tenemos. Ofrecemos esas oraciones a Dios Padre usando las palabras que Jesús nos enseñó. Together let us stand and offer all these prayers using the words that Jesus himself gave us. Our Father, Father Noah's heart in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. We just have a few announcements before our closing prayer tonight. First, in a special way, please join us here tomorrow night at 7 p.m. for our final talk of the parish mission, where Sister Janet and Sister Carol will talk about living the Eucharist. Acompáñenos mañana aquí a las 7 para la última sesión de la misión sobre la Eucaristía. If you're enjoying the mission, please consider a donation to help us sponsor more activities like this. A collection box is available in the baptistry. They didn't give me permission to pass the box in the church. So it's out there. Pero si quieres contribuir para más actividades como esto, es totalmente opcional. Hay una canasta de depositar dinero afuera en la potestería. And please join us tonight for hospitality after the mission up in Father Williams Hall, courtesy of the Parish Social Committee and also the Holy Famine Women's Guild. Acompáñenos esta noche para un, una merienda y convivo después en Father Williams Hall, cortesía de la Sociedad de las Mujeres y también el Comité Social. And now let us conclude with a prayer. Concluimos con oración. Holy, loving God, we rejoice in all the moments of reflection that we have upon your never-ending presence with us as we live our prayer. Dios de amor, nos regocijamos que estés con nosotros y por haber tomado conciencia de tu presencia. Queremos recordar cada día que no estamos solos y que tenemos un Dios amoroso, poderoso y bondadoso. We live constantly in your presence and joyfully turn to you in prayer, knowing that you are always there to hear us, your faithful and committed disciples. And we ask this through Jesus, our brother. Amen. Amen. Amen.